Okay. So thank you very much, Neha. Um, I understood you will go for the CTA 62 soon. Yeah. Nice. Where do you stand with your CTA preparation currently? Uh, I'm at a place where uh, I started to do mocks. I mean, I planned it. And uh, as far as the topics are concerned, I've just gone through them once, but I still need to revise them because I feel like uh, I'm, uh, I've mixed up things a little bit. So I'm at a place where and I need to go back and do a revision. Yes, yeah. I completely understand, like going back like to the basics again. Yes, so the step one is to go through everything once in detail. And then once you're going through everything in detail, you just skip out on some, some details that, hey, this is something I can take later. I will just go and complete it. So those details, like some attributes or some details and some JSON in job token or something, you know, right? So those things are something I need to memorize and I need to remember yeah. that part is. I completely, I still have my, uh, I had my to learn CTA to learn list. It was a long list, like you say, where I just kept all the backlog. Um, yeah. I know your background is in, in, in coding and development. I know you're a good architect and you have business understanding, but you're, the background is coding, correct? Okay. Yeah, back in the so this is why I have a special um, rec a coaching for developers prepared. Okay. The exercise today is, Neha, to tell a business story. Okay. So what we do now is you explain me the data model from a business mm -hmm. point of view without using technical terms. Okay. 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 So today I'm going to talk about the uh, data model for a sales process and uh, the CRM system of uh, this university company. The sales process starts at uh, wherein the company is looking for some prospective customers, which they are going to uh, capture it as leads in the system. And once they identify those leads, okay, before even going into leads, first they are going to run some marketing campaign to even get those prospective customers into their system. So they're going to be creating campaigns in the system and defining the campaign members as to who is going to work on those campaigns, what is the campaign about, how long they will take to run that campaign, and um, how many people are they covering or how many customers are they covering as their prospective customers. So that will be captured as leads. Now, a sales representative from a universal company is going to come and look into the leads and see whether these leads qualify as prospective opportunities or some uh, winning opportunities within the system so that they can get business out of it. So once these leads are qualified, they convert these leads into business accounts or person accounts, depending on the type of customer. So the customer is, uh, the account is the center of our whole CRM system. Now, uh, each sales representative will work with a, a single customer who is our account and create opportunities with them. Now those opportunities will be like our DAs in the system that will define whether what kind of product or what kind of business that these customers are interested to do with us. They can define or they can uh, track what sort of products that they are interested in using opportunities. And uh, you can relate those products with those opportunities uh, on this particular data model object. Then later on, if that particular opportunity is something that the sales representative uh, is uh, uh, very sure that is going to get one, is going to move ahead with the stages of the opportunity using Kanban use and Salesforce. And uh, once that opportunity is won, that is some, some business revenue, right? And uh, the sales representative can provide quotes to the customer that, hey, this is what you needed. And this is a quote from our side for selling this and this product or this service to you. And once this quote gets approved by some senior manager or the customers and everyone uh, can uh, you know, define these approval processes um, that gets uh, 
approved then uh, you can create contract between the customers for uh, repeated businesses or you can also place orders to define whether uh, what transactions have happened between the two parties which is us universal company and the customer here now there are various other entities involved in uh, uh, this whole uh, sales process that has come long way from defining the campaign getting the campaign uh, getting the leads in the system then qualifying those leads into our accounts as customers and then working on the opportunities defining each opportunity stages and converting them to codes and orders and contracts uh, you can also work with um, um cases here that if after the purchase of a particular product or a service a uh, customer is facing some issues we can always raise some cases with us so you can leverage the case object which is uh, related to the contact the contact is someone who is part of that company or person account that we are dealing with the customers uh, employees so you can trace uh, them back to the contact and um, this is how you keep the ongoing services after the sales that you have done inside your system and you can also uh, interact with the customers using a partner portal and you can also always devise each partner or each customer as a user in the system in the partner object and define partner roles so that they will only be able to see what they should see as per their uh, uh, what they are entitled to see in the system and um, interact with us as universal company whether they want to raise case whether they want to create orders or codes or approve codes from there and everything can be done from that partner community and that is how they interact with our uh, system so this whole model will define the process of where our customers how our customers came in uh, whether they were uh, eligible to be our customers and how they did business with us and how they are interacting with us using customer community is whole this whole database model is defining great job amazing job i knew it neha that you will be blown me away uh, this was already known i think lily spoke a few things i would do slightly different okay um <laughs> First, I would I think um, the partner object is um, used different than you explained it. I think the partner object is not needed for the partner community. User and contact is needed because I just saw it on the data model, so I had to justify it. So I used it. Don't if you're not hundred percent sure, don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Make okay. sure that you are hundred hundred percent sure because I you lost kind of almost all trust in me by saying something which was wrong okay you know we, you know what i mean do you have to be so rather say nothing than say something wrong so the partner object okay. is um an a cane object i think we don't use it too often anymore this is representative if a partner helps us to sell an opportunity then we can use the partner object um to identify that as who helps us to sell an opportunity if we are in a b2b2b B2 B2 environment Okay. That yeah, nothing to do with the partner. Yeah. Yeah, nothing to yeah. do with the partner community. Okay, and it yeah. also can be used for sharing, which was correct. Okay, then yeah. I would add the cardinal cardinality to most objects. So, I would say one opportunity, as a, in um, as part of the opportunity sales process, we can have multiple quotes. Yeah which can be accepted or rejected by our customers. So add the cardinality or one account can have multiple contacts which are employees of that account. Yeah. So add the... Yeah, hmm? yeah, yeah. To show the how normalized or denormalized the model is and yeah. Yeah, so you can also say um, one, uh, one, um, one lead can be part of multiple campaigns which is represented yeah. as the campaign member object. So you can you know, add a little bit um, the cardinality there. Other than that, I would, I, I, you did a really great job actually. I would add a little bit more flavor on saying something like um, the opportunity can have an independent life cycle from the, uh, the quote has an independent life cycle from the opportunity. Um, the, the quote is part of the opportunity sales process. You explained it a slightly wrong, I would say. Do you know what I mean? Can you explain maybe the quote and opportunity one more time? How they relate to each other? Yeah. So it's a it's a 
it's a one is to end relationship wherein one opportunity can have uh, multiple codes so i would have explained it better if the uh, if uh, the price, products and prices was there because for each product is it's, it's with relation with contract and uh, so before even signing the contract you send multiple codes and versions of it and then get it approved and then opportunity is one i think maybe there i went wrong yeah yeah <laughs> Can you try again? Yeah. Like start with the, you know start with the opportunity and just say it all like one more time. Yeah. So the sales representative would then uh, when start to work on a business, they will understand the business through opportunity object, and then once uh, they do it and they understand it, they'll send the quotes to the customer using quote object. An opportunity can have multiple quotes uh, related to it, and once the quotes are approved by the customer. and customer is happy with what the uh, quotes are the terms that we have provided for the business that we want to do with them uh, then we can go ahead and or sorry the sales reps can go ahead and close the opportunity as one or loss depending on what has happened with the quote and, and yeah. what um, and how does the contract play come into play with that yeah so um a quote can only have one contract associated to it so whichever quote has got approved uh will have a contract associated with it and what, um, what does the contract yeah. represent a contract is the business relationship between the uh, customer and our business together yeah. so what what does a yeah. a contract represents the agreed yeah. on terms yes and from which date to what date whether it's active or not whether yeah the terms actually with respect to the timeline etc correct mm -hmm. and what does it mean that one contract can have multiple quotes how does this come into play yes because um uh, we could have um, a scenario wherein there could be multiple opportunities for a single customer right but then you only have a single contract with that which could be related to multiple quotes okay so right. we have yeah. contract amendments contracts are amended yeah okay that is much easier a <laughs> simpler way to tell us yeah okay do you want to try again to explain contract yes so a contract is a business agreement of terms and conditions uh, which apply within the customer and our own company and uh, it can also vary uh, uh, I'm sorry. I I'll, I'll start again. Maybe you start with uh, the in order to. You know, you do we do the simple method in order to. Okay. In order to um, create a contract between a customer and uh, the company, uh, you need to have approved quotes and approved agreement between the two parties. Once that agreement is approved, we create a contract. and a single uh, customer can have multiple contracts depending on the uh, multiple opportunities or contract amendments related to single opportunity so a contract can be related to multiple quotes and quotes can be uh, related to multiple opportunities and contract vice versa okay um does the contract yes. have its own life cycle mm -hmm. yes indeed uh so it depends on the status of the contract and the time it has been activated on so yeah that i have a very limited knowledge on that but uh, i do believe yes it has depending on the time and the activation of that particular contract with the customer absolutely correct and what the, and now um i would try it one more time from my point of view um um as part of our sales process we use the opportunity object in order to model potential uh, sales uh, potential um sales um within the in order to model different 
price points on different conditions, which we offer to our customers. We use the quote object, which has, um, so one opportunity can have multiple quote objects, which have, and the quotes have their own life cycle. And once a customer accepts one of the quotes and we accept the quote as well, the opportunity becomes closed one. The opportunity in turn um, becomes then a contract. The contract uh, in order to represent the agreed on conditions between the customer and our company, we use the contract object. Um, in order to represent any uh, amendments to a contract, the contract have, can, can have multiple quotes and opportunities, which then change the contract in turn. Um, once the contract uh, once the contract or once a deal is a, a reach between the customer and our com a company, um, we in turn need an, an order to fulfill the um, agreed on project. This is where the order object comes into place. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do one more time, like from account to, uh, to contract, you know, the whole sales cycle? Account to contract. By the okay. way, you're, you're, doing great. you're doing great, by the way. Thank you. Like amazing. So, okay. thank you. Uh, so, I thought I will I will skip the lead part. Just the place where we have a customer and a sales representative is looking at it. Yeah. So I'm at that timeline. Okay, they're good. Uh, so, uh, as a sales representative looks at a customer, uh, he starts to look at different business deals that he or different ways of business that he can do. So he creates an opportunity, and once he's working on an opportunity, he starts to look at different different uh, terms or agreements that he would then uh, uh, put to the customer and he'll produce multiple quotes on an opportunity. Once uh, a single quote is approved, uh, depending on what customer likes or what he agrees upon, uh, will get approved as a quote and then a contract will be created between the customer and the company uh, to represent the uh, terms and conditions or, of the particular deal that is being made. And now, uh, after the contact is created, which has its own life cycle, uh, by the way, this contract uh, can have uh, multiple quotes related to it based on the amendment, right? Now, this contract that has been created, depending on its active life cycle, orders will be created uh, out of it and will be associated to our customers. On this, uh, and those orders, once they are fulfilled, the customer will get the services from our company. Nice. Really, yeah. really good. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, um, I think you're really safe on that side. Let's try. Let me just. Okay. This is the laptop to school system landscape. And no guarantee that it's correct. It's just an, we use it as an example. Yeah. Mm. Um, within our Salesforce, we have. Um, four different communities, which we use on top of the service cloud in order to give our external customers, partners, recycle customers, and donators the, op the option to interact with our Salesforce data. Um, our, it, we use the service cloud in order to, to allow our internal service resources um, to support our business process. We, will, we can, I recommend using MailChimp for our outgoing, outgoing email campaigns and Einstein Analytics or Tableau CRM in order to fulfill our um, cross-platform and large data volume reporting needs. In order to create documents um, and uh, have our customers sign these documents, I recommend using Congo Composer and DocuSign, which are both app exchange packages and have their own integrations with Salesforce. Our external partners, some of them need um, mobile access in order to allow them a pixel perfect and a branded as well as an easy to use App, I will recommend use a mobile publisher, which is connected to Salesforce, uh, authenticated against Salesforce via the user agent flow via OAuth uh, using the REST API. In order to allow social login for our customers, I recommend using Facebook and Twitter, OpenID Connect. Um, if, for our cloud storing, uh, to integrate um, the cloud storage system with our Salesforce internal system to allow the access to the external files, I, re I recommend using Salesforce Files Connect. In order to authenticate our internal users against our Active Directory and um, allow them seamless login across the different systems, I recommend using Salesforce Identity Connect, which is on-premise. Um, behind our firewall, we have our integration layer consisting of the ESP and ETL. Going forward, I want to talk about um, additional systems which are connected. 
we have a government estimation website, which gives us back the um, estimated value of um, laptops, which we connect to Salesforce via the ESB. The ESB in turn is connected to Salesforce via the um, uh, authenticated against Salesforce via the JWT bearer token flow via OAuth, and the connection itself is done via REST. We have a shipping fulfillment system, which my assumption was that it is um, in the cloud and we can also connect it via the ESP. Our inventory system, which manages the number of laptop, no, I, I can't quite remember. Um, number of laptops is also connected via the ESP. And lastly, the corporate assets management system, this is of our partners, is connect, uh, which are partners, they connect to our Salesforce system, not directly, but again via the ESP. In order to, the ESP will help us uh, not only with orchestration, routing, and error handling, but also with, um, has um, an additional security layer by acting as a reverse gateway, or a reverse gateway. Lastly, we have the ETL, which periodically exports data from Salesforce to the data warehouse in order to uh, fulfill our off-platform storage needs. Yeah, I think this, this is something, yeah, you asked about my weaknesses. This is not one of them. I can try it. Let's try it. Let's try just yeah. one part of it. Okay. Uh, so for our uh, for our company to use uh, a system to uh, deliver the end-to-end -end requirements, I would suggest uh, Salesforce as the center of uh, uh, center of the system, wherein we will be hosting our service cloud, which will have a community built on top of it. And those uh, communities would include uh, volunteer communities, schools, uh, recycling and donator communities. Now to support uh, these uh, communities uh, on top of uh, this cloud, uh, I will use some extensions in Salesforce. Uh, one would be a mailchimp for outbound, mess outbound email messages, Einstein analytics for uh, dynamic reporting requirements. And uh, for my document requirements, I would use uh, Doc Conga Composer and uh, DocuSign. Now, since we have a uh, uh, pixel, we need pixel perfect uh, uh, user interface uh, for each and every users, like volunteers in schools, etc. I would recommend using mobile publisher to have a, a consistent user interface across, and uh, uh, that uh, mobile publisher would be uh, connected to the Salesforce ecosystem um, via user agent flow. Um, and the authentication will happen through work protocol, but then by REST API to connect the data with. Uh, then uh, for the You're, users to log in. You're amazing. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, okay, Look, go Thank ahead. But... <laughs> okay. Now for, for our users to log in via their social sign-on, uh, social, uh, social credentials so that they don't have to manage many passwords. Uh, I'll uh, recommend using Open ID Connect uh, as my uh, integration mechanism between uh, FB and Twitter, so so that they'll be able to be specific. It's an authentication mechanism, not an integration mechanism. We do authentication. Okay. Yes, authentication mechanism is Open ID Connect for social integration. And uh, there was uh, one requirement wherein uh, the the documents uh, or images. I'm not sure about the scenarios. So I'm just using documents or images which needs to be stored on our cloud. So I'll be using uh, Salesforce Files Connect uh, to have a connection between Salesforce and that uh, OneDrive or Google Drive. Uh, now our users, uh, the identity of our users are stored in Active Directory. So I'll be using Salesforce Identity Connect, uh, which then will be um, using SAML protocol to authenticate the users and so that users will be able to log into SSO and to the Salesforce system. Uh, now, uh, uh, as as given in the system, uh, the list of systems in the scenario, uh, there are various other systems holding uh, the functionality, like ship and ship payment system, which is going to be uh, uh, doing, uh, which is going to be fulfilling the requirements of shipping. Uh, it's going to be connected to our ESB, and in turn, uh, our Salesforce uh, is going to be connected to our e ESB using. Uh, uh, the data is going to be flown now uh, using uh, REST API integration using JWT auth token and authenticated by OAuth protocol. I think I slipped there. I, I was supposed to use JWT first as the authentication mechanism uh, and then for authorization OAuth and then 
the data will be flown through REST API. So that should be the flow. And I would start with the big picture and say we use, we have an ESP and an ETL as an integration layer. Start with the big picture. Yes. Okay. Yes. Behind the firewall. Yes. Yes. So Sorry. I will start again. Yes. So uh, to connect the external systems with Salesforce, I would have uh, ESBs uh, behind the firewall. And uh, to connect it with the data warehouse, I would have ETL uh, at the same place. Uh, so my uh, ESB will be connected to my shipping fulfillment system uh, to fulfill the requirements of shipping and delivery. And then inventory management system, wherein I have the information about uh, the inventory of laptops. The corporate asset management system, which has the information of uh, all the assets and uh, how they are managed. And the government estimation uh, website will give me uh, the data for the estimation. Uh, now, as these systems are connected to ESPs, that mm -hmm. will provide me um, the uh, functionalities of orchestration, the point to point, multiple point to point connect, error handling, and uh, routing of point to point connect. I think, yeah. Don't say point to point and, connect. Uh, point to point connect is what we actually want to avoid. Yes, multiple point to point. It's like a yeah, mashup in my mind. It, so but, yeah, but routing. In, routing, yeah. Because in my head, as soon as you say point to point, I'm like, no, don't do it. I'm scared. Don't do point to point. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, but so other than mm -hmm. the reason why I'm using ESP is for the proper data orchestration, the routing, and error handling. Uh, and in turn, uh, the ESP would be connected to Salesforce using JWT or OAuth flow uh, for the uh, authentication, and it would be using OAuth protocol for authorization, and data would flow uh, using the REST API. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I'm so happy. I'm so proud of you. You do such a great job. Okay, let's try, you know. Um, walk me through your C my CI CD pipeline. Yeah, okay. Um, There's nothing to correct with you. It's kind of boring. Uh, oh my God, seriously? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I've seen so many mocks, I'm just I'm just kind of replicating how these people talk and I hope I'm not recording. <laughs> and I'm just learned from so many people. I've learned from you, I've learned from Lilith, I've seen Adam Watson, Adam Watson on loop. I think and you really proved the value of watching a lot of mocks. Yeah, I've judged a lot of mocks. I've seen John Luca presenting, I've seen, uh, so many people, yeah, Jitendra, Vinay. So, okay, L walk me through, through my CI CD pipeline. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, since our client has a requirement of uh, uh, continuously delivering what has been uh, uh, decided after the sprint and the agile methodology, we need to have a mechanism wherein all our developers and development teams are able to. Uh, push their development into the uh, testing orgs and have it tested and uh, go for a defect-free production deployment. Now, in order to implement that, I recommend that every developer will be doing their development on scratch org on the, um, and their development and unit testing will be carried out in those scratch orgs. Now, once after they're done, they will build a feature branch and merge their features or development into those features branch and push their development to the testing environment, wherein the regression testing of their features will be done by the testers. And then once that regression test is passed, yeah. Yes. It's automated regression testing. Okay. But then I've never, okay, I'll have to read about those tools such as Covar for automation testing. Um, Provar oh, is for so UI testing um, and yeah. So what is happening in the scratch org, so you usually do, do only the unit tests for your own stuff. But once mm -hmm. you uh, create a pull request, you do a full end-to-end -end regression testing automatically without, because if you do the full end-to-end -end unit testing, the developer would mm -hmm. have to work, uh, wait. Okay, so I would not suggest this uh, regression testing as an extra step uh, because I'm not very confident talking about it. I would just say that just uh, deploy it to a dev pro sandbox 
and do a functional testing by QA team. You have to this do a full thing. now you have to do a full regression, an automated full regression testing. Okay. So but what that happened? Would be in the pipeline? Hmm? That would be in the pipeline. Yes, this will be automated. So as soon as the you as the developer, so the, we don't, the developer does the unit test, but then the developer uh, creates a pull request, and the pull request in turn um, spins up a scratch org. The scratch org in the um, using something like Probar or a, some pipeline tool, then the, mm -hmm. the scratch org is spinned up um, with the whole how's it called the whole either in the scratch or in a dev work, this is correct, then we do it, we build a complete solution. We run all the unit tests like backwards. As, you know what okay, I mean? Okay, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll start from the scratch now, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I'll start from the place where developer is creating a feature branch. So after completing his development on the scratch or the developer will create a feature, uh, feature uh, branch and create a pull request and push it to another build org, which is another scratch org and perform automation, automated regression testing to ensure that he's not uh, affecting or impacting the already built functionalities in the system. And uh, because our developers are coming from different, different uh, teams, they are already not aware of what has been in the system. So this step is uh, required. Once that regression testing, automation, automated regression testing is passed, uh, they will again push their uh, changes to integration org, which is a dev pro sandbox. And therein, the QA team will be performing the functional testing of the functionalities that are being introduced. Once uh, those, once those uh, uh, test cases are passed by the uh, QA team, and when we go get a go ahead for the this integration testing, we uh, move ahead to the phase of UAT testing and move the changes to the partial copy sandbox, wherein we have data, which is a lookalike look of uh, uh, production data and more user-based uh, testing can be performed by UAT users. And, production uh, data, be careful. What about the production data? Look alike of production data, not the production data. Nice, yes. or ma masked yes. production data. Mask production data, correct. Yeah, I'll use that word. I'll remove the lookalike from my dictionary. Lookalike is, then, I learned that. I will use that going forward. Thanks, Nia. <laughs> and uh, once uh, the uh, the product management team and UAT testing team has approved the test cases uh, in the partial copy sandbox for the testing, uh, the, uh, the feature will now move to the staging org, which is the full copy sandbox. And we're in the end-to-end -end testing of uh, the whole functionality will be done with respect to the uh, what is present in the system. Also, the performance testing and load testing uh, will be performed and migration will be tested with uh, the mass data that is required. Uh, so if there is a functionality, so I don't need to go there, but uh, if there is a functionality uh, that requires data migration in production, then we have to test it in the staging or if there are any scripts that need to be run, any batch that needs to be run, any data that needs to be loaded from other system, any trigger on or switch, everything needs to be tested over here. And then once um, everything is approved by all the testing teams and all the development teams and everything gets passed, then we move to production. And we do a technical checkout and smoke test in production on the test data. Nice. If there is any issue, then we create a hotfix branch and um, inform the support team about it that we have created a scratch or then hot fix out of it, we make uh, fix the changes and push it to production and do again a uh, smoke test on top of it. What situations would we need a hot fix branch? Because our uh, feature is already made out of production, right? So any fix Every that we need to, yeah. So if any changes we need to quickly fix and put it to production, then we'll be creating a hotfix and what would what would indicate that a bug has to be fixed quickly? Uh, if there is any immediate impact on the users. Any say, bug that impacts the or any mission critical something like that. Yeah, they are not able to edit the stage of the opportunity and a lot of deals are stuck. Okay. So at that point of time, yeah. Nice. Uh, which tools are you suggesting to use? I would suggest uh, to use Azure DevOps integrated with Git and or Copado. One, such as one, which one do you? Azure DevOps. Okay, I would, yeah. if, you, if you talk about this pipeline, which was all great, um, I would add which tool helps 
at what point? Okay. So Copado, that, because you said that the developer pushes it to the build work. No, this is what Copado does. Hmm. This is automated. Um, uh, Prova does um, automated regression testing in this build in the build org. Uh, we use uh, SonarCube to uh, do a static code analysis on the pull request. You know what I mean? And before yeah. you start, I would also add the big picture again. What do you do? You do a source code driven development, uh, which and using the following, you know what, I, give me the following, the, a, a fully, fully automated fu uh, source code driven development model based on the Git branching model. You know, give me the bigger picture before you start. Yeah, I was just uh, re just revising the journey of a developer and tester, but not telling what they are using. So I need to add that. Right? Yes, you, it, it helps okay. me. And start with the bigger picture. So maybe can you uh, take, tell me the bigger picture, like at the beginning? Yeah. So. In order to, what do we want to achieve with all of this CICD pipeline? Yeah. In order to continuously uh, develop and deploy the changes uh, uh, that are dynamically coming uh, from the business requirements in the agile mode, uh, I will go up with the source code driven development that uh, that is fully automated by use of the tool Microsoft uh, Azure DevOps. And uh, wherein a developer can easily spin out a scratch org and do his development and unit testing in it. And once that is done, uh, he'll then again use the functionality of uh, automated pipelines inside it and build another scratch out for automated regression testing. Once that is done, he'll again uh, use the uh, automated pipeline from moving into pipeline and uh, releases that are already defined in the system and use them to go to the integration org or uh, which is the dev, uh, dev pro environment and facilitate the uh, functional testing for the QA team. Was that okay? Yeah, um, what does the QA team use um, as a, let's say as a, as a tool to know yeah. what has to be tested? Yeah, so uh, all the incidents, uh, all the test cases are managed in the same tool of Azure DevOps and they are associated with the uh, pull requests and releases that the developers have pushed. So it gives them an automated environment wherein all the test cases of that path, then it informs the developers and uh, every pipeline that the, this particular functional testing is done in the system. And uh, if there are any defects in the case, all the defects are associated to the same release or pipeline. So you can work on a single release in, in the tool and move your uh, testing from integration org to the UAT org and work on another release which has the same definition, but on another partial copy sandbox with uh, different users, such as UAT testers and the product management team, which will then again perform the similar test cases, but uh, also um, for the, if there is any other team who's also uh, pushing some other releases, they'll work on multiple releases, wherein the functional testers are working on singular releases. Now they'll be working on multiple releases. And uh, once those releases are uh, tested, and they'll be moving to staging uh, org, which is a full copy sandbox, and uh, perform the end-to-end -end testing with the uh, performance. And what does end-to-end -end testing. -end testing exactly mean? The end-to-end -end testing would be uh, test the entire functionality in uh, defined test cases by the testing team. So uh, end -to -end, the testing team- End-to-end -end means we, up to up to the staging sandbox, we test against mock interfaces, and end to end means we test against the real integration interfaces. So against the staging of the okay. EMP system, against the staging of the yes, the, the, yeah. So they will test the right. So in the end to end testing, uh, they'll be using the re replica or testing environments of the uh, integrated system itself, of course they'll use the actual interfaces and uh, do the integration testing, performance testing, and loop testing, and also migrate the data, try to run the batch shops or scripts or enable disabled triggers and everything uh, related to that will be tested in the uh, staging org to make sure everything will work in a mass production environment. 
and uh, ensure that nothing will break and then only give a go ahead to move to production and once that release is completed then we'll make another we we'll make use of another pipeline to move to the production environment for deployment nice okay um and what do you need the hot fix for hot fix will be needed for an immediate fixes that uh, might break the existing functionality of users so the hot fix branch can be spinned off and for the fixes that needs to be done on immediate basis and once they're done they'll be pushed directly to the production nice and then we can use the uh, reverse pipeline uh, created in the azure devops tool to push those changes back to the uh, sandboxes now a personal question do you prefer rebasing over merging what is your pre preferred way of working i would say if the team is following a, a specific process then the rebase won't be required and merging would do so we need to have strict processes in the system okay good i would yeah. recommend you did a great job but i would recommend go and to uh, watch a few videos around git and merge and so on so you know a little mm -hmm. bit more you know what i mean and maybe the prova homepage mm -hmm. is a really good source of information it's already pretty good but you know what i mean like make sure you brush up a little bit there yeah i don't know anything about prova to be honest but, uh, even yeah, if you I don't recommend the tool it's just they exp it's a good concept behind it okay you know, okay I'll so now um, to wrap it up, yeah. Two more important sentences: the first sentence and the last sentence. What's the first sentence of your presentation? Hello, everyone. My name is Neha, and I'm going to be presenting a technical scenario on companies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, let's practice again because this is the most important sentence. <laughs> okay. Hello everyone, I am Neha Naguri and I will be presenting the CRM solution for Universal Company. When, hello, I'm Neha. I'm a Salesforce architect. You're a Salesforce architect. Yeah. Aren't you? One of the best. Go. Yeah. So try again. He hello everyone, I'm Neha Naguri and I'm a Salesforce technical architect and I will be presenting a scenario on the CRM solution for Universal Company today. Nice. One more time. Hello, everyone. My name is Neha Naguri, and I'm a Salesforce technical architect. And today I'll be presenting a scenario, a solution on. I'll stop again. Sorry. Uh, One more time. Hello, yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, please. Thank you for being so patient, Johan. What do you mean? Um, so patient with me. <laughs> no, you are <laughs> amazing. You're one of the best students I ever had. Okay, I'll thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Neha Nagori. I'm a Salesforce technical architect, and today I'll be presenting a technical solution on CRM. Yeah. Today I'll be presenting a solution on. Today I'll be presenting a technical solution for the CRM company. You don't solution. only no. It's not only. Hey, I, uh, hello. My name is Johan. I'm a Salesforce architect. Today, I will present the proposed Salesforce architect, this proposed architecture for universal containers. It's not proposed only the technical. Or whatever you do, prepare one sentence and make sure this sentence is perfect because you will need this sentence definitely, and it will be the first one. Yep. It sets the stage. Okay. One more time. Yes. Hello, this is Neha Naguri. I'm a Salesforce technical architect, and today I'll be uh, proposing a architecture on universal containers. Nice. Proposing an architecture, a solution architecture, or technical architecture. You don't need to mention that. It's right? not technical architecture. It's an end-to-end -end architecture. End-to-end, -end, yeah. End-to-end -end sounds well because only oh. architecture is sounding a little bit dull. So today I'll be proposing an uh, end-to-end architecture on universal containers. Nice. One more time. CRM system. Yeah. Hello, my name is Neha Nagari. I am a Salesforce technical architect. And today I will be proposing an uh, end to end architecture on the CRM solution for universal containers. Nice. Nice. Oh, one more time because you did it so well. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Neha Nagari. I'm a Salesforce uh, technical architect. And uh, today I'll be presenting an uh, end to end architecture on CRM solution for universal containers. Okay, now you have to do it two more times because it's, now it's perfect. Hello, my name is Neha Nagori. I'm a Salesforce technical architect. 
Today, I'll be presenting end-to-end -end architecture on CRM solution for universal containers. Hello, everyone. My name is Neha Nagori. Uh, I'm a Salesforce technical architect. Today, I'll be presenting end-to-end -end architecture for CRM solution of universal containers. One more, one more time. Hello, everyone. My name is Neha Nagori. I am a Salesforce technical architect, and today I'll be presenting end-to-end -end architecture on CRM solutions for universal containers. Okay, and now the lo perfect, amazing. Make sure you know what. I mean. Okay, now your last. I write that down somewhere. Okay, so this was my proposed solution for this whole solution. Uh, so this was my proposed solution for the end-to-end -end architecture of a universal container, and I'll open the ground for question and answer. Can you do it again? Because you, you, your voice cracked a little bit at the end. Yeah. Okay. I'll start with thank you. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this was my proposed solution for the uh, CRM system for universal containers. And now I open the ground for question and answer. Nice. Thank you very much for listening to my proposed solution for the end-to-end -end architecture. I'm looking forward to your questions and uh, to your questions and feedback on the proposed solution. Yeah. Whatever, but okay. amazing. One more time, please. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my solution on uh, proposed architecture for CRM solutions on universal containers. I would now open the ground for question and answers. Okay. Somehow it doesn't fit right yet. I try to write it down. Like afterwards, you know, if you write it, it becomes yeah. easier than just saying it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Break it up and then. Yeah. yeah. And Make it these two sentences should be perfect because they you need them hundred percent of the time. Yeah, I'll just write them down. Yeah, not now, down. but I just write them down to remember that I'll write that down later. Yeah, okay. So yeah. thanks a lot, Neha, for the time. Yeah. I will stop Thank the recording. You.